Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to the Myth Salon. Today is a new moon. And I know that because I woke up feeling this morning and I said, what is happening? So out of sort of frustration and wanting to see what might be happening, I Googled the moon and the odyssey. And I was really astonished to find out that there was quite a parallel between Odysseus and the moon. Turns out that when the soothsayer comes to Penelope to talk about uh, the return of Odysseus, although he didn't know when, there was an eclipse and in the writing, he talks about the blocking of the sun by the moon and that that's going to be when this is going to happen. So these two people, these two scientists track these and once every 2000 years, you get this phenomenon. Well, the Odyssey is ostensibly from about 800. And even if it's oral, the purpose of a lot of these oral traditions was to keep the stories, the myths alive, that for 300 and some odd years, there was this story that included this, this oracle coming in and talking to Penelope about that. And they've tracked this down and they actually have the date of it, which is, um, you know, it's uh, April, April 16th, 1178 BCE. Doesn't help me today because I still have these weird moon feelings. And those of you who know me know that the moon is kind of a real central character in my existence. So that's a long way of saying we're in the middle of a new moon and I couldn't be more pleased to find out that it actually resonates with the topic in a very synchronistic kind of way. Uh, who, who would have figured? I want to start off today, as we do, with a little bit of silence for us. Even if it lacks some of the poignancy that it had during the pandemic, I really don't want us to lose sight of the fact that more than a half a million people suffered and died through the pandemic because of the coronavirus. And hardly a day goes by when I don't think of how this country and the entire world has been tragically ripped apart by this. Today we have Dr. Joel Christensen, who is a, an amazing classic scholar. And I have his book called The Many-Minded Men that he was kind enough to send me. It's a great book. Before we begin, I'd like to read one of my favorite poems that coincidentally relates to the journey of Odysseus poem, poem called Ithaca by Kavafi, who's an Egyptian fellow who wrote this in 1911. As you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one, full of adventure full of discovery, Lastragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high. 
as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lastragonians and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope the voyage is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbors seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can and may you visit many Egyptian cities to gather stores of knowledge from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for, but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all that you have gained on the way and expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will understand by then what these Ithacas mean. I'd like to dedicate that to my good friend, Richard Byrne, who passed away a number of years ago. One of my mentors at the University of Southern California. All right, Will, why don't you join in, introduce us, and let's settle back and go on an odyssey of our own. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. And uh, gosh, a couple synchronicities, several actually. And, and the first I just want to say is um, actually that poem was read to me by a mentor as well, uh, in, in addition to yourself. And that was at the uh, Joseph Campbell Foundation um, Mythological Toolbox at Esalen. Bob Walter opened the event uh, very close to the opening of the event by reading that. And what's so cool about that is I was there with one of Dennis Slattery's mentors. So um, another synchronicity that's just special and I got to point out, you know, you mentioned it's the new moon. I had no idea that there was a, a, um, an eclipse related to this story, but some of you may know that there's an, a solar eclipse today. And as uncanny and interesting as that is, uh, this is not the first time that this accidental alignment has happened uh, as um, we held a Joseph Campbell Foundation Mythological Roundtable at the Ojai Foundation one time with Kayleen Asbo, who some of you know, on labyrinths and Theseus, and we had a plan to walk the labyrinth. We had no idea that we had scheduled out of the blue the labyrinth walk during the eclipse, uh, which is a crucial uh, moment in the story. So here is a second event that we've scheduled uncannily, accidentally on the eclipse. Uh, so I think that's special and, and I don't know what to say about it except for to say it. I've been looking forward to this event for a long time with Joel. Uh, we're in the middle of that moment uh, in which we have begun uh, and need to begin healing from a truly global catastrophe. And the, the way most of us know how to participate in that has to do with story as psychologists, mythologists, as storytellers. So it's, uh, very important um, to look at how that works, how that's worked in the past. And one of the most powerful examples of that, uh, one of the most powerful examples of all time is gotta be the Odyssey, um, an epic that responds to the trauma of the Trojan War, which is just uh, a story that's actually about a much larger event in the Mediterranean. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce our panelist and our guest. Uh, you all know Dr. Dana White, who's a scholar, author, and host of this Myth Salon, contributing faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute. My name is Will Lin. I'm the founder of Myth House and the General Education Department at Hushing College, where I teach myth to filmmakers and performing artists. We're also joined by uh, Dr. Dennis Patrick Slattery, who's a mythologist, scholar, po poet, a longtime professor in Pacifica's doctoral program in mythology and a prolific author. Uh, check out his works on DennisPatrickSlattery.com. Uh, but I've got to pause uh, first to just say, uh, Dennis is who many of us in this conversation and, and listening has have learned the Odyssey from, uh, from his epic class in our uh, PhD program. So 
Uh, I think many of us will probably try and clear as much path as we can to hear as much as possible from Dennis. So really just awesome to, to be setting up that conversation. Uh, Selena Matthews is a clinical psychologist, author, keynote speaker who graduated from Pacifica and has been an ever-present uh, participant and supporter of this Smith Salon. She is the CEO of Soul Transformation uh, Seminars. Zaman Stanazai, professor of mythology and political science at Pacifica and Cal State, is a poet, linguist, mystic, and Fulbright scholar. Uh, he's recently, he's written extensively on a wide range of topics from Indo-Iranian languages to identity politics, political philosophy, Sufi poetry, and esoteric Islamic thought. Um, Boris Nunley is a professor of philosophy, literature, and rhetoric who lectures across the country on the intersection of literature, spirituality, myth, and contemporary life with an interest in the dark feminine race and transformation. Uh, also an honor to welcome and thank Connie Zweig who helps us invite such amazing guests. Connie is an internationally renowned psychologist for her work on shadow, whose book include Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow. Keep an eye out for a conference that she's putting together at Pacifica coming up this fall on aging and mythology. And finally, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Joel Christensen, uh, who is a professor and chair in the Department of Classical Studies at Brandeis. He's been a fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies and has received the Society for Classical Studies Award for Excellence in Teaching at the collegiate level. During the pandemic, Joel joined the Center for Hellenic Studies and Out of Chaos, uh, Out of Chaos Theater, to launch Reading Greek Tragedy. This followed his 2020 publication of the many minded of, sorry, of um, the Odyssey Psychology and the Therapy of Epic. Other works include The Many Minded Man, articles on language, myth, and literature, and in the Homeric Epics, a commentary on the Homeric Battle of Frogs and Mice. Homer's Thebes and A Beginner's Guide to Homer. You can find more on his website, which you can find in his mythhouse.org portal, which is being shared with you right now. Thank you, Joel. We're looking forward to hearing from you and a rich conversation this evening. Thank you everyone, Will, Dana, Connie, uh, for inviting me. Um, I think the occasion for the invitation was an article I wrote for the conversation um, about the ways in which the Odyssey can help us think about rejoining society and separating from isolation. Um, and it's part of a larger story, uh, which is the Odyssey, and what it means to be human, um, and what I think of as the ancient Greek guidebook to the human mind. Uh, so I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint in just a second. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes or so. I'll gladly take interruptions um, and then uh, disruptions and um, a deeper conversation um, at the end. Uh, so as, as many of you are, I'm deeply interested in um, uh, storytelling. Uh, so part of my method in this is making stories central to everything I do. So I don't have a script today. I'm going to be telling a bit of my own stories um, that have to do with reading, uh, writing, and teaching uh, the Odyssey. Um, so let's start with the end of the Odyssey. After 20 years, Odysseus finally gets home. He gets in disguise. He tricks the suitors into shaming him so he gets to murder them. And he introduces himself to his wife again. They reunite. And then there's book 24 of the Odyssey, where Odysseus goes on another type of journey. We start with a trip to the underworld. And then Odysseus goes to see his father gardening in the withdrawal in these trees and these gardens where he's been for years. And he goes to see his father and he lies about who he is. He deceives him. He says he's somebody else who knows Odysseus. Laertes breaks down in tears. And Odysseus says, no, 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 I'm Odysseus. I am your son and Laertes doesn't believe him. And Odysseus opens up his cloak and shows the famous scar on his thigh that he got from a boar hunt when he earned his name and his father does not believe him. And then Odysseus points to the trees in their orchard and starts to recount for his father all of the trees and their names and where they came from and to tell him the story that his father told him when he was a young man. This moment in the Odyssey, which you see in this woodcut here um, from, I think it's uh, the 1700s, um, is one that people um, famously don't know what to make of, right? Um, the Odyssey's final book is uh, chock full of what I call moments of problematic closure or a lack of closure. In addition to the um, reunion um, between the father and son and this weird second trip uh, to the underworld, we also have 
um, a split decision that I'll talk about later where people decide whether or not they should kill Odysseus. Uh, we have the death of one of the suitor's parents. We have a conversation with Zeus and Athena where they decide to make everybody forget what has happened. And then the poem ends with a dea ex machina. Athena comes down and says, you'll all have peace and be happy. And boom, the epic tradition is over. Now, if you're thinking that's not the Odyssey I remember, well, you're not the only one. As early as Aristotle, we had a little confusion about what's going on with the end of the Odyssey. Aristotle, when he summarizes in the Poetics um, how the Odyssey ends, he says, well, Odysseus in the yellow here returns, he's storm-tossed, once he reveals himself, he attacks the suitors, saves himself and destroys his enemies, end of poem. Right? There's nothing about the father, there's nothing about Penelope even in this sad summary of the Odyssey, and one might wonder, what was Aristotle reading? All right? um, but then it gets a little more complicated. There's this moment in the end of book 23 where Odysseus and Penelope finally reunite. They get into bed and it's such a big affair that Athena makes the night extra long, not for extra lovemaking, but so that they can tell each other their stories. And as you might expect from a man like Odysseus, most of the night is him talking um, and not listening. But later traditions, so as early as the Library of Alexandria, scholars were saying, what's up with the end of the Odyssey? Why do we need book 24? And you have um, one reported scolion, and so these are marginal notes in the manuscript tradition, says that Aristophanes of Byzantium, not the comic poet, and Aristarchus, an editor, believe that this was the end, the peros, the boundary of the Odyssey the moment when Odysseus and Penelope get together. Where another account though says that the men said it was the telos of the Odyssey. Now in Greek or in English, these words are both ends, but in Greek, they amount to purpose or goal or aim. And it doesn't necessarily mean the boundary. So there's been a debate for at least 2000 years about how the Odyssey should end and why uh, it ends the way it does. Um, and as recently as 20 years ago, there are still a majority of scholars saying, I'm not quite sure the poem we have ends the way it should. Now, it's my contention in general that if a, if a poem or piece of art confuses you, you should probably work a little harder to understand it. Um, but I have to confess that I spent years not understanding what happens at the end of the Odyssey, not understanding why Odysseus has to go see his father, and not understanding why we need all of those different moments. Um, so the story I'm going to shift to now um, is a story of a different type of odyssey, of an interpretive odyssey, of a journey through coming to understand the text in a different way. The Odyssey is one of those poems like the Iliad, like different cultural narratives uh, that's enriched by where you are in life, the changes depending on your experiences. With each new reading, it is a different poem. It is more the Heraclitean river than the river itself. In 2011, um, I taught the Odyssey multiple times um, to different type, types of students while reading different things. In the same year that I lost my father suddenly uh, to um, a heart attack that was related to drug addiction and drug use, um, and in the same 18th month period, I welcomed two children to the world. Um, I found myself reading the end of the Odyssey differently, and I found myself thinking differently about the end of the poem. When my father was probably my age now, when I was in third grade, he bought three acres in the middle of the woods in Maine, um, pine forest. They spent the rest of his life turning into lawn, which is an insane and not uh, very ecological thing to do. Um, by the time I was in high school, I would have to refuel a lawnmower to complete the mowing of that lawn. Um, when I returned to Maine to help scatter my dad's ashes, um, the land was unrecognizable except for the places where we had planted bushes, where we had planted trees, where we had repaired old stone walls. And for me, I realized that the land itself tells a story. The land presents a series of metonyms for opportunities to sort of be transported into the past. And when I looked at the moment of Odysseus being reunited with his father, I realized that there's part of a pattern that's part of the rest of the Odyssey that's about filling out that story of who you are. So what I wanna do with the rest of the time after I've made a little bit of a long introduction is explain sort of the story of the book I came to write from this process that's really barely about my father. It's inspired by him and the experience, um, but it's a story of what happened um, over the years that followed. 
I started my career working on the Iliad. I, my first year, my first week in graduate school was 9-11 uh, and I went to graduate school in New York City and saw the towers come down um, from my department offices. I went on unsurprisingly to write about the Iliad and, to, and rhetoric and politics and the idea of war. Um, and I really worked on the Iliad until I found myself teaching the Odyssey again and again and finding students responding to it in a way that I never did. Now, during the fir mo first part of my career, I taught at the University of Texas, San Antonio, which is a, not only a minority Hispanic institution, but a, sorry, majority Hispanic institution, but it's also um, the largest veteran serving institution in the United States, or at least was at the time that I taught there. Um, and I had saw, watched students respond. I watched them live with the Odyssey in a way and then found myself respond to it. So I started to ask a series of questions. What was it about the Odyssey that was meaningful to them? How had I changed in response to it? And is there something more than meets the eye? Um, so in order to get to sort of the end point, Odysseus back in the trees with his fathers and understanding this sort of pre-Father's Day talk, um, what the epic has to say about what fathers do to sons and vice versa, I'm gonna take you on a couple um, side journeys of my own. I want to talk about why epic matters and the idea of folk psychology. Um, then I'll talk about clinical odysseys, really what I think the odyssey is showing happening with human minds. Um, and then we'll get back to fathers and sons in the epic tradition um, at the end. So I want to start with the concept, with the concept of uh, folk psychology, right? And so epic poetry in the ancient world is it like a combination of CNN, the Bible, a science textbook, um, and the most beautiful song you've ever heard, right? It's something you live with. You go back to it every year, part of ritual, part of entertainment, part of identification. Um, and it answers the big questions of human life about metaphysics, what is possible in the world, epistemology, what and how do we know, but it also encodes audience understanding of the workings of the human mind. So when I sat down to think about the Odyssey, um, I started to think about how does it reflect human agency, human belief about who we are in the world? And I followed, ended up researching a series of questions that started with agency, moved out to storytelling, and goes around the themes that I'll outline here. I'll talk a little bit about each of these, um, but in the book, I talk about them more. And just to make it clear, I'm not here to sell the book. I signed away all royalties um, to support open access publishing. Um, so if you steal the book, that's fine too with me, um, but it's not supporting authors in the future. Uh, so one of the, my first assumptions or, or movements when it comes to working with Homer is to uh, imagine that the epics transmit an assumed theory of mind, a basic idea about hum how human minds develop, function in the world individually and with each other, um, and also how they can incur and experience maladaptations. And so this led me to think about things like agency, determinism. I got away from free will because free will is a naughty subject and that's K-N-O-T-T-Y, but it's naughty in the other way too. Um, and then I moved to really focus on concepts like learned helplessness to see how it structured the, uh, the epic um, and then moved to other things and to therapeutics. Um, so I'll talk about in the next few minutes about two major things. So learned helplessness and the structure of the Odyssey and then sort of the therapeutics of narrative. Um, but these are all topics um, that I think about when it comes to the Odyssey. Um, and sometimes when I talk about the Odyssey, I actually sneakily mean the Iliad too, uh, because I think they're a complementary pair. They're like night and day, they're peace and war. Um, the Iliad teaches you what's worth dying for. And the Odyssey teaches you why you need to live, and then how to cope with life um, if you get it. So there's this amazing moment in Odyssey 15. Odysseus is in disguise. He ends up in the hut of the swineherd Eumaeus, um, and Eumaeus says to him, let us delight in one another's gruesome pains while we drink and dine in my home remembering. A man may delight later on in his pains when he's suffered many and gone through much. So I started thinking about what it means to tell people your story. What Odysseus does, even with his lying tales, is he reveals a part of himself that's centered to his pain and suffering. And he also elicits stories of suffering from other people. There's a very simple message in the Odyssey. And part of it is that how you suffer and survive is part of who you are. 
And the most clear symbol of this is, of course, Odysseus's scar. One of his early names, the one you know from Latin, Ulysses, is from the Greek word for scar, ulos. So Odysseus is one of his ancient names, means the scarred man. He is someone who is defined by this marker of his identity that in a way um, is really a, a metonym for the way each of us is marked by life, by the stories we live and the experiences and the deeper scars we bear are often the ones we cannot see. And the structure of the Odyssey is shaped by an unfolding of different types of identities. How do we know who Odysseus is? When Odysseus first shows up on Ithaca, the only way we know he's Odysseus is because we're on his side and we've been listening to his story. But there's this beautiful moment in book 16 when he meets his son Telemachus and Athena unveils him and Telemachus says, oh my God, you're a god. And Odysseus says, no, I'm your father. And Telemachus says, no, I'm pretty sure you're a god. And Odysseus says, no other Odysseus will ever come home to you. And that line has sat with me for years, because to me, that's at the center of the Odyssey. One, how do I know who you are? Two, how do you know who I am? And three, how, how do I know who I am? And we get our identities from the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, from the stories other people tell about us, and from those rare moments where those two categories agree. And so much of our pain in life, so much of our suffering and dislocation comes from believing something about ourselves that other people don't believe or knowing something that other people don't hear. Odysseus's trip home isn't a physical journey. It's a reunion with who he used to be. It's a reconciliation with those different parts of his identity. And there's a series of movements. The story of the Odyssey is what we call a nostos. The word is homecoming in Greek, but it's not just a physical return. It's a return to the life that you had before. And because it was before and you've changed, it is impossible. But the Odyssey proceeds through a series of recognitions. And this word might be familiar to those of you who know tragedy. Aristotle again talks about it as anagnorosis, as that point of that inflection point in a story where you get the knowledge of the truth. But the Odyssey, as in other myths, um, takes a slightly different path here. It says that knowledge is unfolded slowly and it's when other people recognize things in you. So let's go back to that moment in the trees in book 24 on my chart here, um, the, the, uh, the final entry. It's anticipated by five different reunion scenes that follow similar patterns. Odysseus meets someone in disguise. He lies about who he is. Um, he doesn't trust them or they don't trust him. And then they look outward to something else, an object in the world that tells a story. Odysseus doesn't believe Athena that he's on Ithaca. She points to the cave of the nymphs. Um, uh, Book 16, Telemachus just takes it because he's naive and he's uh, manipulated, so we won't worry about him. Um, but in book 19, when his nurse Eurycleia sees his scar, it brings up the story of when he was named. He confirms who he is to the suitors with the bow that he strings and then kills everybody. Right? Um, when Penelope tests him, she pretends to have moved their marriage bed, which was carved into an olive tree. He built the house around. And then finally, we get to Laertes and the trees. The objects in the world contain stories for us. And when we tell them to each other, we confirm that we are the people we used to be, or at least we have some of it that left in us. So as I thought about this recognition and the problems and the challenges of storytelling, um, I thought about a lot of the things that many of you are already well-trained in and probably better versed than I am. And that's things like, uh, you know, uh, Freudian family dramas, Jungian archetypes, and the basic insights from uh, mythographers in the 19th and 20th century, where they really focused on um, myths as aspects of our own personal and cultural narratives. What I got interested in was the confirmation for these things that come from multiple modern accounts. I got interested in neurobiology and cognitive science, and of course, going back to different types of psychology. And in the way in which our brains are actually hardwired 
for stories. Uh, my favorite account of this is from Joseph Ledoux, who's a neuroscientist at um, NYU. I, I tutored his son in Greek when I was a graduate student, so I got to hear this firsthand. Um, and he did a series of experiments when he was a graduate student with split brain patients, patients um, who couldn't, whose brains didn't communicate one side to another. And so they would give input to one side of the brain and then see what happened with the other and try to make sense of it. And what they found constantly is that people were straining to make sense of the world of disparate images, and they were constantly lying about what they saw, confabulating, creating narratives of coherency that made sense. And so Joe's answer to the question of consciousness is that it's the brain telling itself a story which is perhaps too simple, um, but it's something I enjoy. And so I, I put these things up here just because I've been inspired that, by them, uh, but also because I think the observations made by psychologists prior to fMRIs and modern cognitive science hold up more or less under pressure for, in other um, disciplines, right? especially when we think about the development of the human brain for storytelling. Um, one of my favorite aspects of this is when we talk about memory science and the development of, uh, of young human beings. Um, so in the same time period that I had two children who were growing up and into brains and becoming conscience, conscious, I got to watch, unfortunately, my grandmother lose control of her senses, lose control of her stories and her consciousness over time. I read that book by Charles Fernihoff, Pieces of Light, where he cites people talking about this thing called um, the autobiographical uh, memory, right? That moment when children put themselves at the center of their story often coincides with when we're capable of encoding memory. So there's a connection between memory, the story, and identity. And I'm just gonna say that and let everybody uh, accept it, and we can talk about it later. Um, and what I, what I argue in, in my work um, is that the Odyssey knows this, right? And that the Odyssey is interested in how um, human minds negotiate their own stories and their sense of the world. And one of the big ways in which this happens um, is that the Odyssey makes narrative sequencing and causality central to its experience. So most of you know the Odyssey, right? And the Odyssey is about a man struggling to return home. But if you stop and read this translation of the proem to the Odyssey, it tells a slightly different story. I'm going to read it so, so that we can get in the same space. And I want you to contemplate what it says. It says, speak memory of the cunning hero, the wanderer blown off course time and again after he plundered Troy's sacred heights. Speak of the all the cities he saw, the mines he grasped, the suffering deep in his heart and, and at sea as he struggled to survive and bring home his men, but could not save them hard as he tried. The fools destroyed by their own recklessness. Now, I could keep going, but I just want to point out a couple of things. There's nothing in the intro to the Odyssey about Telemachus. There's nothing about Penelope. Um, there's very little about the Trojan War. We hear about a man who suffers and a man who failed to accomplish what he wanted to. And I want you to listen to that line again. They were fools destroyed by their own recklessness. This line comes up again less than 30 lines later. As Zeus looks down on a different story, the story of Aegisthus, uh, the cousin of Agamemnon who shacked up with Clytemnestra and murdered Agamemnon when he came home, he looks down and shakes his beard and says, mortals, they're always blaming the gods and saying that evils come from us when they have pain beyond their lot because of their own recklessness. Now, the same phrase is repeated in 30 and under 30 lines. And that phrase in Greek is sveis and atasta liesa. It rings through the epic. It's the only repeated sequence in the first 30 lines, and it would jump out to ancient audience. And it does something that's really important. What it does is it tunes the beginning of the epic for us. It tells us to look for, to listen to different things, and it also sets the Odyssey apart from other myths, especially the Iliad. The Iliad declares clearly in its first nine lines, Dios de Teleotobule, and Zeus's plan or will was being completed. The Odyssey 
goes to great pains to say twice that sure, gods are in control, but human beings make everything worse because of their own recklessness. This is a radical departure from a purely deterministic point of view. It says that human beings have some agency in the world and that you have to be on the lookout for it. Now, for me, this is a narrative frame for the whole epic. It's a programmatic statement, and it has several things to say, right? It vitiates against the excessive fatalism of the Trojan War and the heroic tradition. It says human beings have control. Second, it introduces concepts of agency and different notions of causality. So from the beginning, I think that the, the epic is in a way therapeutic because it asks us to look at human agency and engagement in the world, to think about causality and as a way of doing so, mirroring our own view of the world. So the epic consists, concedes that humans have agency. It points to agency in, in action. And then if we're in doubt, the first two narratives we engage in the epic, um, question why people aren't acting and what control they have over their lives. The story of Telemachus and the story of Odysseus that start the tale are all about people who have agency but can't use it, who are helpless in the world and need to do something different. So here's where we start to think about um, how the epic deploys these ideas. Um, so one, in, in addition to the end of the, uh, of the Odyssey being confusing, people are often frustrated at its beginning. Why do we have to spend so much time with whiny, whiny baby Telemachus when we want to get to Odysseus, right? Part of that, of course, is a delaying mechanism, making us long for Odysseus even more, but it's also setting up structural and thematic issues. Um, and so we'll start with the education of Telemachus. For me, sort of a breakthrough moment in talking about um, the beginning of the Odyssey is I was reading an op-ed, New York Times or somewhere, sometime in 2012, where people were talking about poverty, learned helplessness, and making some very broad um, generalizations. And I sat down and I thought about the basic definition of learned helplessness, right, that you can condition someone um, to expect failure, and by conditioning them to expect failure, they'll actually have uh, worse outcomes when they even try uh, to act in the world. I thought about this concept in some of the experiments, and I just taught a class about the beginning of the Odyssey. I said, what happens when we look at Telemachus and Odysseus, and does this make sense? So the class worked, so I started reading a lot. I started reading in developmental psychology and really started to think about Telemachus as a symbol. Like, what does he represent? And he represents someone who has had a deficient learning community at the least, right? But he also represents someone who has no good reason to not be doing anything. He's 20 years old, he's the son of a hero, and he just sits around. And the first time we see him, he's sitting there daydreaming, wondering, and the, the, the quote I um, highlight there, if, he, if his father would ever return and scatter the suitors from his home. Telemachus is in a way, how the other Greeks in the Iliad are to the gods, to his father. He wants somebody else to solve his problems. He doesn't act in the world and he's habituated, um, in fact, to, to not acting at all. So I started to do more research on learned helplessness. Many of you know this stuff more and to think about how being conditioned to think you can't act in the world, being raised in an excessively deterministic society without any models, models for action can trap you into a cycle of inaction. And that's um, how I got to really starting to look at the beginning of what happens with Telemachus. And a basic pattern happens in the Telemachy repeatedly. In every book, some different characters say, oh, the gods in control, I can't do anything, right? Athena shows up in disguise to, to Telemachus and says, well, maybe you can do something. Let's try something in a lower stakes setting, right? And they negotiate and they come up with a different idea. And then we get this, what I call ideal aesthetic, where gods and man work together. Um, and then you go out and you experiment and try to do things in the world, right? So, so Telemachus goes through this basic pattern. And I bring up the pattern because it anticipates what happens again with Odysseus. Again, keep in mind that the Odyssey starts out by telling us that people fail because of their own recklessness. And then it shows us that maybe the corollary is true. 
if people make their fate worse because of their own recklessness, maybe they can make it a little better if they're just not that dumb. So that's where we get to the story of Odysseus. When we first see Odysseus at the beginning of the Odyssey, he's in kind of a weird space, right? He's on the edge of an island. He's been there for seven years. He spends all day crying. And at night he has sex with the goddess, um, but he doesn't really like it, okay? Um, this is a strange situation. And as some of you who know the plot of the Odyssey knows, uh, Hermes comes, he says, hey, build a ship. And Odysseus says, okay, I'll build a ship. Um, he builds a raft and he gets off the island. And so my opening question with students is, why doesn't Odysseus build a raft for seven years? The facile answer is that the gods haven't authorized it yet. But if we're in a narrative where we're constantly being asked to think about how human beings make their fate worse or better, what does it mean that Odysseus starts exactly the way his son does? doing nothing, not acting. So my basic take on this is that Odysseus could represent from the ancient world a couple of things. One, he's another stand-in for a type of conditioned helplessness and inability to act because he doesn't believe he can act in the world. I also um, suspect that there may be reflections of um, social dep uh, engagement deprivation, so the effects of isolation um, when it comes to uh, Odysseus as well. But that's a, sort of a side thing. The main thing I want to focus on um, is what do we do when someone's locked in a concept that they can't act in the world, that they have no ability, um, they would have no agency. So there are, again, as many of you know better than I do, uh, different ways to treat this. There are cognitive behavioral therapies, there's narrative therapy, there's occupational practice. Um, and I actually think we get a little bit of all of this in the Odyssey, right? So another thing that people think uh, may ask is, okay, so Odysseus is in book five on the island of um, Calypso. Why can't he just go home? Why does he have to go through this process? And so my basic assumption is that something meaningful is happening here. And we have a repetition of what we get with Telemachus, but much more detailed. First, he has to build the ship, the raft on his own. He has to demonstrate his skill and his ability to work in the world, right? So that is a really important step. All right. And in a way, I think that his building of a raft is a stand in. It's a symbol for his rebuilding of himself. And then you get sort of, you know, an extinction therapy, a behavioral therapy sort of process that happens next. Um, in the second half of book five, Odysseus has to choose four times at least to survive. He has to act to swim. He, have, he has to cling to the raft. He has to decide to live. Right? And so we're not just given a character who gets to go home. It's not magical. It's hard, and it has to be part of his own agency. So part of what I think is going on in that sequence is we have to get Odysseus to the point where he's able to act in the world, where he chooses to act when before he didn't. But of course, we're not done yet, because Odysseus has to figure out who he is. So part of what happens um, with Odysseus in the epic is that he tells a lot of stories. As some of you might remember, some of the most famous uh, events in the Odyssey actually come from the story that Odysseus tells in books nine through 12. So people tend to have different explanations for this narrative. I think that it's part, uh, in a way, it's part of a talk therapy and that it's directly related to the opening lines from Zeus. So I'm gonna go rapidly through these stories, but I'm gonna focus on the moment when Odysseus unfolds a new analysis of causal events that he did not have before. So here's a basic outline of what I think happens with Odysseus. But part of what inspires me is the practice of narrative therapy as described by Michael White and others. Um, and what I think is happening in the story of Odysseus is a compressed version of people retelling their stories and renegotiating their identities. I think we're supposed to understand Odysseus's grand telling of his tales in books nine through 12 as the result of him spending seven years ruminating on what he did to screw up so badly. Right? Um, so this is part of what Michael White calls reauthoring conversations, retelling your story in a way that centers you as an agent rather than an object. 
Um, and he's inspired in part by um, Jerome Bruner and really focusing on um, what he calls intentional state understandings. And so I'm, I'm putting the books up there so you know what I'm being inspired by. If you wanna talk more about these later, uh, I, I'm happy to. So Odysseus gets a story elicited from him at the beginning of book, or end of book nine by his host, Alcinous, who says, tell me why you weep, right? Because Odysseus has been weeping there in secret over the story of the Trojan horse and before the story of him fighting with uh, uh, Achilles. And Alcinous says to Odysseus, the gods fashioned this pain and they spun it out, out ruined so that it would be song for us and men to come. Now, if you're listening to the Odyssey, this should put off alarm bells. The gods fashioned this? Where's human agency in all of this? And Odysseus responds to this by saying, what shall I tell first and what shall I tell last? Yes, the Uranian gods gave me so many pains, but now I'll utter my name so that you will know it. Since I have avoided a pitiless day and have come to you to join, join you as a guest in these halls, I am Odysseus, the son of Laertes, who's known among all men for my tricks. My fame reaches up even to heaven. This is the first time in the epic that Odysseus names himself. But he doesn't name himself as a father of Telemachus, doesn't name himself as the husband of Penelope. He names himself as a son of Laertes. And I think this is a moment of him reclaiming his identity. To go backwards just a moment, um, Part of what I've done is to create charts inspired by some of the workbook work that uh, Michael White does in narrative therapy, um, looking at how Odysseus at the time of the telling of his story, so this moment of the apologia all the way to the right, is reflecting back on his narratives. But when we tell narratives about the past, they're not really about past events. They're about who we see ourselves as now. So part of what I think is going on in um, the story he tells is the result of a iterative process of reflection, reconciling his identity um, with what happened before. When I teach the Odyssey, I give students a uh, handout called the blame chart. And I ask them to go through all of the bad things that happened to Odysseus and figure out whose fault it is. Um, and what's amazing about this is if you go through it carefully, uh, Odysseus is telling a story about himself in which he admits that some of the key mistakes were mistakes he made that other people asked him not to. And in the key moment of them all, so I'll give you another one of my um, ugly charts, he's looking back at what happens at the moment of the Cyclops. Now, as many of you know, I'll go back to the, um, the blame chart, that the, 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 the coup de grace of the Odyssey in this is when Odysseus blinds the Cyclops. Yeah. But it's not quite the story um, that you think it is. Um, because Odysseus, when he tells the story of Polyphemus, says that they came to an island that had lots of goats on it. And then they saw a different island and that was the island of Cyclops. And his men said, don't go there. And Odysseus says, no, we're gonna go there. And he takes them. They get inside the cave and his men say, well, we've got good stuff now. Let's take it and leave quickly. And Odysseus says, no, I wanna see who lives here. And I wanna ask him for a guest gift. And then the Cyclops comes home, rolls a rock in front of the cave and he eats the men. Um, Odysseus still has the arrogance to ask for a guest gift. And Polyphemus says, I will eat you last. Of course, they blind the Cyclops and they get out Right? And as they get out, they get into the ship, they're rowing away, and Odysseus starts to taunt the Cyclops. Like right um, and the, um, and so, as he's taunting so, them, um, his men say, um, uh, stop, Shh. You're, going, you're, going to, um, you're going to get us killed. Um, and he doesn't say that, right? Instead, he shouts out who he is. That's he right. says, I'm, I'm, Lair I'm Odysseus, the son of Laertes. I'm from Ithaca. The same identification that he had before, oh, sorry, at the beginning of the story. Um, and then that is the end of the story for him. Now, I just want to make it clear that Odysseus doesn't have to tell the story in this way. He chooses to tell the story in such a way that it is his fault that Polyphemus knows his name. When we get to book 11 in the Odyssey and the famous part of, uh, that, um, uh, of Tiresias' prophecy, um, what we find out is that if Odysseus had not done that, if he had not named 
himself. His men never would have ended up on the island of the cattle of the sun. They never would have eaten that terrible meat that they talk about at the beginning of the epic. And the suitors never would have come to his home. The suitors don't actually come to his home until three years before the beginning of the Odyssey. So I've given you a very rapid take to a complex tale there, but I just want to recap what happens with the agency ascription in the um, story Odysseus tells. He frames the story as, as, as he frames suffering as divinely authored, authored, but he goes through step by step um, to see where he was at fault and where his men were at fault. And he identifies his own agency in the blinding of the Cyclops and the angering of, of Poseidon, and then ventriloquizes this through his quotation of Tiresias the prophet, um, saying that the major suffering of Epic was initiated, initiated by Odysseus's own actions. So sort of the, the secret code in the Odyssey that most of us just aren't patient enough to listen to is that Zeus's comments at the beginning of the poem that men make their fate worse than it needs to be because of their own recklessness is actually supposed to apply to Odysseus. And by listening to Odysseus go through this process, we're supposed to understand how to do the same thing. Right? This is an epidaxis, a demonstration for the audience how to think about causality and responsibility and how to trace out what all philosophers in the ancient world were looking for, which is the causes of things. So now as I sort of round out to the end of my prepared time, I want to get back to the end of the epic, but I want to talk uh, just briefly about what happens um, before we get there. So Odysseus gets home in book 13, and too often um, we rampage through that just to get to the moment where he kills the suitors. But Odysseus gets home in disguise, and he weaponizes narrative. Part of what we learned in that latter part of the epic is that Odysseus has reclaimed himself and his agency in the world through story. And that's a powerful thing. You can control the universe through story. But what we find out with Odysseus is that he can also use it to manipulate other people and take their control away. He uses it to manipulate marginalized enslaved people. He uses it to manipulate women. Um, and he uses it to sneak his way back home, steal all the weapons away from people, and murder 108 people in his home. So what the end of the Odyssey is really about is the danger of narrative. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those things here, but in, uh, my, in the book, in chapters uh, five and six and seven, um, I talk about how he weaponizes narrative. I talk about the marginalized agency of enslaved peoples in the Odyssey, and I talk about Penelope um, and how she's a third character who's positioned in a place of helplessness, but she never gets to regain agency because that's not what the world of the Odyssey has to offer women. Uh, but that's not what today is about. So the end of the Odyssey, we're going to get back there because that's where I started. The end of the Odyssey is in part about negotiating between um, singular identities and collective claims on reality. If anything, uh, if there's anything we miss about the Odyssey when we look at it, is that there are people in Ithaca and that Odysseus's victory comes at the cost of their agency and their values. A uh, great part of the epic is spent in sort of setting up and entrapping the suitors to make sure they're just bad enough to justify their murder. But the question's always left there, is it enough? Was it enough? What kind of person um, is Odysseus? And what I want to argue at the end is that the suitors are given humanity and we're supposed to question Odysseus. And at the end, fathers and sons come to the fore as a key point in forcing us to think about what stories do to us and what our roots and what our families do to us too. So the Odyssey ends with this weird second underworld scene that I won't talk about, but it sets up the narrative. It focuses us on certain things. And it also just does away with any stories about women. One of the problems with the epic is that Penelope doesn't appear in book 24, which is strange if she's so important. All right. um, then we get to the reunion of Odysseus and Laertes that I talked about. And we get, most importantly, um, to the, what I call the trial of Odysseus. So remember, Odysseus has come home. He went to war with 12 ships of men, and nobody came home, right? Uh, Jonathan Shea, in his book on, the, uh, on Odysseus, court-martials him in the later chapters for being a terrible commander. 
I won't go that far, uh, but there are issues here, right? He leaves the best fighting men in the sea. He comes home alone, and then he kills 108 of the most prominent citizens, prominent citizens in Athens, in Athens, sorry, in Ithaca, right? Um, and what happens here is that the suitors' families gather together, okay? All of the people of Ithaca come together, and they have an assembly. And this man, Eupathes, stands up and he says, friends, this man, Odysseus, has devised a great accomplishment for the Achaeans. That's sarcasm. It's hard to see um, in English. He led many fine men away on his ships. He lost the ships and he lost the men. Then when he returned, he killed those who were the best of the Catalanians. And then he says, look, we've got to stop him or else we'll be ashamed forever. This will be an object of approach if we don't avenge the children who have died. Now, the children who have died is Eupathy's own son. Eupathy's gets up, the narrative lets us know beforehand um, that he gets up feeling an unforgettable grief, Greek alaston penthos, for his son Antinous, whom Odysseus killed. He sheds tears for them and he speaks. Now, this line here, alaston penthos, is really powerful in epic and it's really powerful in the Odyssey because it points to what we might call today unresolved or complicated grief. They're stories that don't have a resolution. And outside of Homer, this pain is used only for parents who've lost their children. And it's a type of pain that requires revenge. It requires a new story to be written because the story of the life that was supposed to be has been ended. Now, the Odyssey in a way echoes the end of the Iliad because it makes us think about fathers and sons and loss. As some of you might remember, the sort of the pinnacle of the end of the um, Iliad is when Priam comes to his son's killer, Achilles, and he begs for him to have, give Hector's body back to him for burial. And the two together weep. Achilles remembering the loss of his friend and lover Patroclus and that he'll never see his father again and Priam remembering the loss of his son. Now, for a moment they become a son and father together and they remind us of this amazing thing, this ideal in Greek literature. And the ideal is something that's mentioned by Achilles himself. When Achilles finds out Patroclus dies, he laments and he says, Patroclus, I thought you were gonna take my son Neoptolemus back and introduce him to my father. The concept of the three generations standing together comes directly to the fore at the end of the Odyssey. Because after that trial I just talked about, after the, uh, the Ithacans assemble, the two sides split their vote. Half of them say, let Odysseus go. The other half say, no, we're going to kill them. And then they all go, they go together to fight Odysseus who stands with his son and his father. And it's this ideal but impossible moment. The end, the Iliad tells us um, that fathers, sons and grandfathers don't get to be reunited because of war. Um, we get a famous scene of Hector with his son Astyanax, um, who never gets to stand in epic with Priam, even though they're together. And then Achilles himself, his son Neoptolemus shows up only to be the one who murders Priam outside of the Iliad. So the end of the Odyssey engages in a fantasy. It invites us to think about, well, what if war didn't happen? What if we could bring everyone back together? And what does it mean when we get to um, have father, son, and grandfather together? And what it means um, is that you have certain guidance. You have a story that you're already sort of locked into. When Eupathy's son dies, he's locked into a cycle of vengeance. He's locked into a system of story and paradigms that he can only get into when the gods say his story is over and it's done. Now, to go back to the real for a minute, um, my father died a month after the picture in January 2011. Um, I got to introduce him to his grandchild, um, and it's a special moment, right, bringing the generations together. My father is the kind of person who started asking when he was going to have grandchildren years before my wife and I were actually married, which was an awkward, awkward conversation um, at, at, at dinner, right? Um, but coming full circle to the beginning of this, um, I don't think I understood the fantasy and the desperation of the end of the Odyssey. Um, 
until after I thought about these pictures. Because the Odyssey ends um, with an impossible moment. The gods recognize the pain of the human beings and they come down and they say, look, we're gonna take just enough away so that you forget what you've done to each other and you can go on living as you were before. And Zeus and Athena say, let wealth and peace be enough. But this is a fantasy. This is not truth, right? This vitiates the basic idea of the Odyssey, which is that our pain makes us who we are. When she takes away the suffering of the suitors' families, she deprives them of the lives that were ever there at all just so she can let Odysseus and his father and his son rule on forever. From the perspective of Greek philosophy, um, this is supposed to jar us. It's supposed to be painful. It's what we call in a platonic dialogue, a moment of aporia, pathlessness. It tells us that something went wrong and we need to go back to the beginning and start again. And so this is another thing, you know, sort of the final thing, um, that makes that I think sets up the Odyssey as sort of a therapeutic intervention. It lets us know that our stories of our pain define us. It lets us know that the way we reunite with the world is by telling stories and listening to them. But it also shows us that there's a peril to letting the stories of the past be too determinative in our futures. To go back to the prophecy of Tiresias, Odysseus is supposed to go on forever right? Eventually he gets bored. He goes journeying again. He takes with him an oar. He's supposed to plant it in the land where people mistake the oar for a winnowing fan and build a temple to Poseidon. It may be too much to think about this, um, but that oar is made from trees, right? The ships he took there were built from things that he made with his own hands, and that oar is taking him on a journey beyond narrative, on a journey beyond the myths he knows. And I think the end of the Odyssey offers that promise. The story doesn't work. It's too violent. The only solution to the epic tradition is to forget it and to tell a new tale. So that's where I'm gonna stop. I'll stop the sharing and then I'd love to hear um, from everyone. Wow. Joel, nice to meet you. <laughs> Uh, Dennis, what do you think? Yeah, it was just it's just a brilliant, uh, Joel. And you and I share um, some fundamentals about the Odyssey, and we I think we're going to disagree on a, on a couple of other ones, but that's why we do these myth salons. Uh, so I wrote a book and published it a year before yours, and I titled it From War to Wonder, exploring your personal myth through Homer's Odyssey. And essentially it's 365 passages, one for each day of the year, with a summary and then a reflection on my part on what the heck does this have to do with us? Mm. And then a writing meditation at the bottom of each page. Because I share with you that I wanted to get the Odyssey out of history and pull it into the contemporary imagination. And it was a joy uh, to write it and to put it together. Let me try something on you. Um, there's that moment at the end of book five when Odysseus naked, everything has been stripped from him except his stories. And he uh, is on Sharia, and there's that place where a wild and a tame uh, olive tree grows. It's the wild and the tame out of the same root. <clears throat> and he climbs underneath it, and he finds all this plentiful dead leaves. And so he tosses them on himself and goes to sleep. And Athena closes his eyes and keeps that one spark of life uh, burning in him. And then Nausicaa and her maidens coming to wash their clothes at the river wake him up the next morning. And he knows that he has to be modest because he wants to persuade her to help him to get home. Well, that moment then of coming into uh, the palace of her parents, um, 
here's how I understand it. Those seven years with uh, Calypso were his incubation. And I don't think he could speak. I don't think he could speak about his history. I think he was too traumatized a warrior to do that. So in that gestation period, I think in his imagination, he's reassembling himself. This is where I think you were really wonderful in a number of places, but this specifically. So that he has to find an audience that will be the perfect host to him being the perfect guest. And it's there that he can tell his narrative. In a sense, he's already weaving himself home and this is why I think Penelope, in what she's doing, in weaving that funeral shroud for her father-in-law, Laertes, um, I would suggest to my students, she's in, she's in effect weaving him home. Mm -hmm. But he's also weaving himself home by weaving his story back together that's just been tattered. I mean, it's just, it's just a, a fabric um, coming apart. So that leads me to why the oath taking is so important all the way through the Odyssey. There's mm -hmm. so, there are oaths being um, engineered and um, worked out all the way through. And then the last moment at the end of book 24, when Athena steps in as a deus ex machina, as you mentioned, she gets them to swear an oath. And for me, it's always been one of the most hopeful moments in the entire Odyssey, because it's like for the first time, a consciousness is being raised that words can actually be more powerful than weapons mm. in um, negotiating conflict. So as long as the words of an oath are held by <clears throat> each party giving up something valuable, because if, if one gives something valuable and the other one doesn't, you don't have an oath. It'll, it'll, it'll collapse in a day. But if each is willing to give something up with a value equivalent to the other, then that tension in language um, holds the peace. So there's a part of me, Joel, that, that wants to say that language itself is the hero of the Odyssey. So, so anyhow, so, I, I welcome any responses from you and thank you for listening to that. No, I mean, I, so I thank you for the richness of, of the comments. Um, uh, I'll, I'll end up with what you just said. I, I think we're com in, completely in lockstep on what happens in book five. We just sort of expressed it from different angles. Um, and that moment, I love that you bring up that sort of saving the spark of the fire, because um, it's one of the most beautiful similes in Greek literature. Right. Yeah. I just found it to be so powerful. Um, yeah. And I do think that he needs, you know, there's, there's an article by William Race who talks about the the Phaeacians as his as his therapist, like Odysseus needs someone to talk to, to acknowledge him. Right. He's not real to acknowledge him. Yeah. Right. To acknowledge him. So that's critical. Yeah. I think the only place and power of language, I'm there completely with you. But um, here's where I would diverge just slightly in that yeah. nothing in Greek myth and epic is good or evil. It's where good and evil happens. So the Odyssey is about the power of language, but not necessarily as purely a force of good, right? It's yes. just, it's a powerful shaping force in the world. And yes. I've been thinking so much about the end of the epic. So the way you just described it as, as a bit of a compromise, as an optimistic moment, um, I see more as a bitter pill of truth. And I mm. th think about this, like, how do we bring together a community in civil war. This is not a question that's academic. Right? No, that's How right. do we knit together communities that hate each other? Yeah. Right. And there are only two historical precedents. One is one side obliterating the other. And the other yeah, is yeah. an unfortunate and painful compromise. Um, so I think, yeah. I think what's amazing about Greek epic is how it communicates in multiple levels at the same time. Right? Yeah. It has it communicates with the individual and the group. And so the group's sort of political communication at the end is a hard truth. 
right? Yeah. And so what happens in history, and so sorry to keep going on here, but there are actual amnesties in Greek history where people try to legislate, you can't bring up this thing, you can't prosecute mm -hmm. on this thing. And the most famous one is from after the rule of the 30 in 404 BCE in Athens. Um, so these 30 tyrants take over, they do many terrible things. And afterwards, the Athenians say, um, you, you can't actually bring this stuff up anymore right? It's over. We have to get beyond, right? And so we have these different models too in the, in now, do we have, do we, yeah. do we have Demnatio Memoriae and just wipe the slate clean? Do we, or do we have truth and reconciliation committees? Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, uh, there are, I, I fear that we are going to be living these things, um, which is, has only made me, I, I think, more engaged with it. But, but thank you. Uh, I, yep, I do yep. think, and the oaths are important as well. So, you know, from just to add a different psychological perspective to it, um, when we think things have numinous effects in the world, right, milestone events or, you know, speech acts, um, that can be an important part of the healing process. And I really hadn't thought about oaths in that way in the Odyssey, um, yep. but but I, I think it's there too. So I thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Joel, very much. I want to keep pulling on the the thread of of narrative and narrative healing. Um, you know, I think of uh, another uh, book that we read in Dennis's class, Epic Cosmos, and one of the points is about maybe reconciles partially what you're saying, where uh, one of the roles of Epic is to be able to move forward by gathering the story of the past. So trying to reconcile, you know, taking responsibility and recognizing what you want to bring forward from the past, but maybe also acknowledging what you want to leave behind. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that moment we keep going back to when he starts the story. And there's something that has always been very special to me about that moment. He goes, as he starts to tell his story, he's got people listening. He goes, this is the flower of life. And, you know, for any of us who are looking to make sense of the flower of life, the Holy Grail, he's holding a goblet of wine and he's saying, this is the flower of life. And it's when he starts to tell his story. And it reminds me of this wonderful moment uh, when Hercules also gets to tell his story with the earwax coming down out of his ears. But that moment is precious to Hercules, that moment when we get to reflect on the story. It, and speaking of the flower, I got it takes me into um, the Satori moment. So enlightenment is the moment just after the flower is at its height. Not when the flower is flowering, just after it, just when it starts to wilt. Not Odysseus out there as the badass conquering the seas. Odysseus reflecting on his own flowering. That's a Satori moment. And so I, I just wonder if, uh, you know, and then I hope we'll go to Selena too, who might be able to talk with us a little bit about uh, narrative healing in, the, in, the, uh, in practice. Uh, but Joel, I just wonder if any of those thoughts jostle anything for you. Well, they, they do. And I, I think, again, there, there's a double sidedness to it in, in the epic that, that I, I sort of get lost in. Um, because he does say he points and he talks about this moment and, and he points and it's it's the telling of the tale. Right. But it's also a moment where he is, in a way, completely in control. So I think, you know, this is Odysseus post enlightenment. Right. And, and, and he's using it. And, for me, the negative thing is what happens to the Phaeacians, right? They become, in a way, vehicles for his journey and then victims of it, right? There's that moment where they, they admit, well, we don't know if you're the guy who's going to curse us, but maybe Poseidon's going to drop a mountain on us, right? And even then, you know, and then their ship gets turned to stone. Um, and so there, there, there's this peril of Odysseus that, that I think people get seduced into not seeing. Right? Mm -hmm. That his stories are amazing, um, and he, he has, in a way, he's transcended to another plane. Right, um, but that means that he takes advantage of, of everyone around him. And what I also like to think about is that there's a second moment when he tells a story in the epic, and that's when he tells it to Penelope. Right, and what happens is we never hear her speak again after he tells his tale. Um, and so this is what back to you know where, where Dennis and and I were finding some space um, is that is the power of story is so, so potent um, that, that it, can, it can remake people in worlds. Um, and, but I do like with what you started. So too often I encounter people who read Epic as something simple. Like this is glorifying war, it's glorifying home. But if you read the Iliad carefully, it's, it's not glorifying war, right? Um, it, it's a lament for failure to defend the people you care about. Right, and what you get and, and what you lose. And, and the Odyssey in a really way, important way is a lament for what you lose along the way. Um, so I, I think that, you know, 
bringing in the moments like this is a moment of enlightenment, a potential enlightenment. It, it truly is. Um, and also, I, I don't. I, I would be remiss not to mention um, that you know, for a thousand years at least allegorical interpretations of the Odyssey said that all of these external details are, are just details. What's really going on here is a drama of the mind. Uh, but thank you. And speaking of drama of the mind, Selena, uh, how does this relate to your, uh, your room, your practice? Well, I, I've got to tell you, um, first of all, the amount of young children coming in that are, are self-harming by cutting themselves, I'm getting more and more, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. Um, so th that's actually very devastating to me to actually see that, that they're having to mark themselves in that way in order to get through this. And each one says to me, uh, I ask them, why do you, you know, why do you do that? Because they have lost their ability to feel. And it's the only way that they can feel is to see the blood come through them. And uh, it's very intense. This has never happened before. So it's, it's, uh, it's another layer that I'm having to deal with. Um, and also because they're coming in so so young. The other piece of this is I'm wondering if a lot more than, you know, my adults who I've seen a lot for a long time aren't harming themselves, but the new people are. So I'm wondering if this pandemic has caused, uh, a, or, or where people are marking it as a physical wound to remember. And I'm just putting it out there because I'm in this process and I'm not sure where I'm going with it or what's happening. I can just see uh, or just talk about in real time what's going on, but this is what I'm experiencing. And you know, to connect what you just observed to where Dennis said before, where he said that Odysseus lost his language. You know, what, what I, what, for those seven years, what I've been thinking about uh, during the pandemic and dealing with students, and, you know, communicating with colleagues, is we we have no paradigms, right? We have no models. We have no language for 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 coping with what's happening to us. And what's happening to us is a complete um, separation from agency, right? I know Dana, you were talking before about not knowing what people are doing. People are rushing out to go out to have parties, right? And I feel it myself because what do we want? We want to grasp control of our lives. Right? We want to wrest it back from these um, powers that were always there, but didn't impress upon us. Um, and that's why, I mean, I hadn't really thought about sort of self-harming and marking, um, but that, that is devastating. Right? But in a, a very basic, fundamental way, it's a reclaiming of agency over your body when that autonomy has been taken away from you. You know, that agency narrative um, is really interesting. You know, we, we're uh, familiar with a, a guy named Jeff Kripal, who's a chairman at Esalen, and he talks a lot about authorship, the arc mm -hmm. in myth and in our lives to authorship, from being a victim of a story to becoming the author. And another guy uh, that's very familiar to most of us is James Hillman, who talks a lot about soul making. You tell your story to make your soul. You're working your soul as you're working your story. And when you're talking about uh, narrative healing and narrative psychology, you're really talking about kind of a fusion of these where it is an arc where you're telling your story to build your consciousness, uh, reflecting on your consciousness through your story, but then making sure that built into that arc is agency. And you just talked about uh, a state where we we've, we've felt a loss of agency. So I just wonder if you might reflect for a moment on the soul making, the narrativizing that might be essential to us moving forward from, from this pandemic. If I could do this well, um, I could help a lot of people, but let me start. So I, I, I think the first thing we need to do is be able to communicate for ourselves what we've experienced, right? And to tell our own stories, but also to listen to other people's stories. So it's a very simplistic thing that I say in that conversation piece I wrote, but inspired by what Eumaeus says to Odysseus, right? Um, until we communicate and articulate what has happened to us and what we've experienced, we don't really understand it. So as Dennis says, again, Odysseus spends all this time trying to figure out his trauma. We are all in the process of being traumatized. And it's not just the pandemic. It's also the apocalypse, the unveiling and reminder of 
you know, police murder of our black citizens, right? It's also fract fractious um, body politic, right? An election, um, the craziness of January 6th. Like we have so many competing traumas that it's hard to articulate it all. And our position in life changes how we process it, right? It's very different for me. I have children, I have a place in the world. I'm a white guy who owns property in Boston, Massachusetts. Like I'm gonna be okay. Right. But what about my students who are 20 year old, years old and they don't know what their future is going to be? They don't have a spouse. They might never need be able to afford to buy a home um, or they've been sitting in unsafe places since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, the world's a frightening place. Um, so I, I think that having the conversations um, is a first way like to process the trauma. Um, but I'd really be interested to hear from the, so the clinical psychologists what they anticipate happening in the future. I've been reading sort of like how people use group work and drama therapy um, to work with indigenous peoples who've been traumatized, to work with Holocaust survivors. Um, and there's just, you know, since World War II, we've had nothing on this scale of global suffering. But what we didn't have then is the shared suffering, right? Uh, we're, we're conscious of what's going on in a way I think people weren't before, right? There's this redoubling um, and acceleration of the conversation and the pain through social media. And I think that that's another aspect of it. Like we're almost at a point of narrative surplus where it's very hard to make sense of our own story in the noise. So then go back to where I opened up. I really think we need to take the time to unplug, to talk to each other, to listen to each other's stories and tell our own and then keep telling them, right? We need to get past the sort of embarrassment of repeating ourselves because the part you were mentioning there, so that soul work you were talking about, it's about rethinking an event, right? And thinking about rethinking our toxic relationship to blame and responsibility. And so this is an example I give all the time. I'll go back to my father. Um, we didn't have much money growing up, so wrecking a car could bankrupt us. And every time something happened to a car, a transmission dropped in a Ford LTD station wagon, my father asked me, what did you do? Right? And it's like, nothing. It's a shitty car. You know, uh, or or think about what happens when we get in an accident. Right. Think about the the, the tension between the words we use accident and whose fault was it. Right. There, there should be a cognitive dissonance here. Like there's a problem with the way we look at causality in the world. We're really interested, interested in taking responsibility for good things and blaming bad things on others. And I think that we need to create, help each other create narratives where we can make sense of what we've experienced of the past year that gets away from that simple dichotomy. If we could start telling narratives, if we could re-narrativize this whole event away from being something that happened at us to a moment in which we claimed our agency, oh my gosh, you know, that would be the world that I want to live in. And, and I'm wondering, Boris, Zaman, do either of you have any thoughts about claiming agency or any responses to what we're talking about? Well, uh, let, let me start in a faraway place. Uh, Muslims don't uh, celebrate their birthdays. And it's been a kind of a struggle for many of us who came to the West and, you know, you have to, you know, make one up and say, well, this is when I was born and we have to stick to it. And God forbid if you for forget it. Um, uh, because when you go to the history books, most of them are saying like, uh, such such a scholar, philosopher, thinker, whatever, who died in this year. Just one date is given. The birth date is not there. And the idea is that you are not who you think you are because you are born uh, in a certain place to a certain family and all that. No. You are uh, measured by the day you died. That's, that is the total sum of the narrative that you have become, that the person who you are and whether you should be appreciated or how much you should be appreciated, all, all of that is measured by, uh, by, by the end date, not, not, not the beginning. And so that's why the birthdays are, are irrelevant. And I think uh, um, Joel started in a very nice way by starting the story at the end which, which is that, that significant part of it, because Odysseus is, is um, he became who he is at the end of the story. 
And I think uh, uh, thinking uh, about it more from the point of view of uh, the writer who was trying to kind of create the outline and the whole thing, those 20 years was, were probably the most he could stretch in terms of the longevity uh, at the time, uh, the, the expected uh, longevity at the time. Uh, otherwise, he might have done it even more than that because he had to be forgotten by everyone. He had to be unrecognizable a long enough time that not even his wife could, uh, uh, could recognize him. And, and so uh, th this distancing was necessary both for the sake of the narrative um, and also uh, so that, that he, uh, the only one who remember, who knew who uh, Odysseus was himself. Nobody knew him anymore. And those were the 20 years uh, which, which were necessary. Then he, he comes uh, home. Um, in a way, it is not the home that we as readers would expect. Because that home has, you know, wife, son, you know, uh, all the familiar environment. And it, well, he came to it when, um, when nobody knew who he was. And in a way, he couldn't, uh, well, at least temporarily could not relate to anyone. And he realized that all the friends and the people that he uh, trusted, at least knew them or expecting them to respect him for who he was, all of them have become abusers in his own home. Uh, not only of his wealth and his property, but also, of, let's see, the, the woman servant and all the rest of it. And so I think that, that that strangeness had to be first created. And then uh, we go to, uh, uh, here is a, a Rumi-esque angle in there, is that in, in the spiritual couplets, when uh, the king uh, goes and finds uh, this beautiful woman that he uh, basically purchases, um, and because he finds her so attractive and so beautiful, he thinks that, well, I mean, the, the love should be returned in the same way, but not so. And so what, no matter what he does, and she falls ill and is about to die and all that, so no matter what he does, nothing happens there until, um, until he goes to the mosque uh, to repent and to prostrate and to weep and to cry the whole night to a point where in, in essence, he washes all his sins with his tears uh, to ask the Almighty, like, what happened? Why? Why nothing works for him? And so this cleansing happens for uh, Odysseus in his own home, who is that all the suitors, all the, all the, the guilty parties, they could be, uh, in a way, his shadow side, that they had to be killed, that they had to be destroyed, that they had to be thrown out so that the place is cleansed. And I think the element of, I think, sulfur is burned there to, to clean even the air. And so that symbolism, in a way, um, becomes necessary in order for us to find who we are. And I think in that sense, um, I, I, I think the whole thing is in the last chapters, 23 and 24. But what I found most interesting is that in, in the Greek thought, um, uh, at least uh, from, from this angle, there is no evil. There is no devil. There is no uh, Lucifer. There is no uh, Iblis or whatever other name you may call him for. Because it's the gods who kind of go back and forth um, through this veil of separation. At one, one moment, they are divine. The next moment, they are human. And they can choose whatever form they, they want to. And they, they are very, very interactive. Uh, and, and in that sense, that I think that blending of the human and the divine, but also like at the end in chapter 24, when there is also a blending of time, you go to Hades and you come back and that, that, that whole... Uh, kind of a, a reverse perspective of people like Achilles and others who are just telling their side of the story. I think that is, that is the beauty of it, 
is that uh, time becomes relative in its own way. Identity becomes relative and sometimes even irrelevant. And it's all built towards the end is like, like who, I mean, obviously he's, he is gonna die, but before he dies, he has to know who he is himself. So that's a kind of the journey uh, back unto himself. Um, which is uh, wonderful, and I, I really enjoyed the presentation. And I, I like going back and forth in this cross-cultural and cross-tradition, if I can call it that, journeys, where, where the symbolism and the significance of um, the uh, certain absolutes, the absolute of the divine, the absoluteness of the time, and all that, that we look through it at it through a uh, an angle of rigidity but i think it's very pleasant to find that um, that that we could be flexible on that we could go back and forth um, there there's a divine within us from the sufi perspective and that divine within you could be talking to you uh, it could become the minerva who uh, uh, and i was at one point kind of uh, nervous because he was saying that uh, uh, well this was uh, bringing in one of the other gods and I think it was Zeus he was mentioning that whether Zeus was going to help him more or Minerva was and then Minerva comes back and says like wait a minute, what haven't I done for you that you're even mentioning another god uh, I think there are all these beautiful angles that it makes us aware of the god within us whether it's personified uh, out of us, whether it's represented outside of us, may or may not be necessary. Um, but uh, I think it's a, it's a very long journey and uh, we can relive it through ourselves in, in, in some ways too. So I, I thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I don't know if this, there was a question or a comment uh, or not, but uh, you're more than welcome to comment on, uh, on the comment. I, I, I would just add one thing. I might thank you for everything you said. And uh, I, I think that the, the reward of rereading and reading with other people um, is that uh, I think that our, our minds are exponentially more agile together and we learn a lot from each other. So I do talk a lot about sort of collective narration um, in the book, but uh, the, your opening comment um, about how, you know, uh, starting at the end is more important uh, because that's how you, you know, that's when you really know who someone is. It echoes um, what Solon, the poet philosopher says in Hesiod's, uh, sorry, Herodotus's history, which is that you can't judge a person's life, whether they're blessed or not, until it's over. And that's like such a central part of Greek culture, of like ancient Greek culture. And it's another one of those things that has a corollary on it. Uh, and this is where um, I always get in trouble with my wife and other people, because I believe that you must, if you believe that you can't judge a person's life till it's over, then you also should believe that until a life is over, there's infinite possibility for redemption and a different story. Right. Um, and I think that's where we get at the end of the Odyssey as well. He's still alive. Maybe he'll be a better guy next time. Maybe not, right? Um, but as long as that, you know, that, that type of hope can be destructive, um, but it also can be, I think, liberating to believe that, right? That the, your story is not over till it's over, right? And it can be a bad ending or a good one. Um, but I think what you learn from narratives like this is you have some measure of control on how you write that end. Um, so I thank you for your comments. Or, I think that there is another way also of looking at it. When you... Uh, when the emphasis is on, on the birth day or birth date, um, you constantly are becoming distanced from it. Yeah. And so you feel your age a lot more that way because you don't know when the last birthday was or if it was celebrated or all that. Uh, however, uh, if that element is taken away, and you know that you will be measured by whatever you achieve uh, you know, at the end point, um, I think there is more like a, a sense of like when you're looking forward to your graduation, th there's a little, a little more positive in that. I don't know if I should be saying that my name means time. So I am I'm stuck between, <laughs> but, but uh, I, I rather be a, um, 
I mean, I feel very comfortable. Sometimes I'm, I'm asking myself, like, I mean, shall I die today? Maybe. Uh, like, any day could be just as nice a day that, uh, that would make it uh, worthwhile going over to the other side. And if there is another side, but uh, at least that's how we perceive it. I'm struck by how we have this tension between individual and collective that today as this pandemic has descended upon us, not only have we found ourselves in a collective culture nationally or in a community, but globally as a species. And it's asking us to think in more universal terms than I think I've been asked to think of in my entire life. Um, because it's asking the big questions. These are sort of species existential kinds of issues that, that really threaten our survival as we are engaging the natural world, we're displacing species, we're we're doing things to ourselves that, that we ultimately have to account for. And when I think of the Odyssey, I'm wondering whether they were prescient in terms of looking at what is the individual's role in taking the collective forward? How is the individual going to serve the collective. Do you think that there's anything to that? So, uh, I mean, I, I don't wanna you know, get myself in too much trouble with the, with the group that works a lot with Joseph Campbell's stuff. Um, but I do think that central to Greek myth um, is the notion that the heroic narrative is devastatingly dangerous for everybody. Right. So to go back to the beginning of the Iliad, right, it says, God has sing the rage of Pelian Achilles, the rage that sent countless Achaeans to their doom, not Trojans. He killed his own people. Right. And something people often miss out on, like when Patroclus dies, um, is that Achilles in book one actually prays for the Achaeans to die. He prays for the Greeks to be punished for slighting him, um, and he gets his wish. He just didn't uh, remember that Patroclus was one of them. Um, so I think that the most consistent theme in Greek epic and tragedy is that heroes are bad, right? Is that exceptional individuals threaten the collective. Heracles kills his first wife and child and his children and is killed by another wife later. Every major hero threatens families and cities. Um, so, and the part of um, part of the tension then in Greek myth is this tension between uh, the exceptionality that you need to tame nature and monsters, and the subordination of that exceptionality to become part of a state and a collective. Um, there's a homerist named Erwin Cook who teaches at Trinity University um, in San Antonio. Um, and he has, a, he has an essay where he talks about active and passive heroics. And what he basically says is, look, in Greek myth, it makes it pretty clear. Heroes suffer and they cause suffering. And that's what they do. And so to go back to this thing, I saw Will unmute, so I, I think he's got something to add, but I do wanna go back to what you yeah. asked about the pandemic. When you go outside and people yell about wearing masks, infringing on their freedom, or not wanting to take a vaccine, what they're expressing in my mind is a rejection of the message that they're not the hero of the story, a rejection of the excessive individualism of our culture and the request that we put others before ourselves. Um, and I, you know, again, not to be mean to everybody who does that, because we live in a culture that, especially if you're male and white, right, you're encouraged to think of everything around you to be your object, to be your playground, um, to be there for you. And American politics exacerbates that, right? Like we are, we're, we're this individualism on steroids, this Randian horror show of, you know, the individual is more important than the group. Right. Um, and this is where I think like those of us who care about narratives need to tell different stories, um, because you're right. We're not going to make it. 
100, 200 more years um, at this rate of valuing, you know, uh, billionaires who want to go to space over getting water in Flint, Michigan that people can drink. So I don't know. I don't know if you guys usually go so political, but I think that yeah, we do. Our base, okay, our base beliefs about how story works in the world and what we value communicates what we do in the world, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that our narratives, our hero narratives, um, twist the our value system um, towards excessive individualism. So that's where I, yeah, that's where I'd like to make a distinction, and it's a, it's I don't know if it's really um, a commonly discussed distinction, but. There's a difference, I think, between what we think of as the heroic or the hero and uh, what I think Campbell meant by the hero's journey. And where what Campbell's talking about is he's talking about the function of agency itself. Mm-hmm. That is the hero in the psyche. Mm-hmm. And so what you're talking about in some ways, like from that point of view, the idea of the rise of agency being good, but the, the hero being bad is, you know, what's really going on here is for Campbell, he's pulling this from Jung. And Jung has this idea of individuation. So the first half of the journey is the deconstruction of the ego, the submission of the ego, the death of the hero. So what many, what Hollywood gets wrong way too often is that they let the hero finish the journey without dying. They let the hero finish the journey without the ego having to be submitted. And actually, so what they, what really we need to see is the complete arc where that heroic ego is exactly the complex this deconstructed to complete the hero's journey itself. The hero's journey includes the return journey. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I was flipped there hoping that you would come in because, you know, in Greek myth, which, you know, Young and Campbell knew very well, um, the, the final stage is the hero wandering the plains hated by gods and men alike, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so my problem, you know, with our myth making when it comes to the heroic narratives um, is that there's, the stories don't let us grow old. The stories don't teach us how to be parents and how to nurture. That's it. Parents. The parent thing is the one that's been killing me. That's been the clearest one to me. Our heroes are adolescents. Look, mommy, tell me I'm awesome. Yeah. Our heroes are adolescent little boys. And if our heroes could be dads and moms <laughs> that care as opposed to seeking affirmation. And that, we, so, and I actually think, so not, not, uh, I'll keep talking about this, but sort of our, our late sort of post heroic narratives that we're getting recently, like Jupiter rising or the boys, you know, some, some of it's trashier, but it does ask us to think about this. Or uh, we've been, just started watching with our kids who are nine and 10, uh, the new Superman and Lois show, um, where like that's central to it, right? And I think that like th- that's where we need to go to an extent, right? Because narratives that don't allow us to um, deal with the totality of human life set us up for failure and disappointment, right? And, you know, life is also changing diapers, right? Life is also subordinating your ego um, and putting somebody else before you. Um, And that's not, you know, and with the difference, I think, between like popular myth right? Edith Hamilton's mythology read badly in, in middle school. And what's actually happening in Greek epic is the richness of that detail, right? Nobody can read the narrative of the Iliad and think, man, I'd like to be Achilles, right? <laughs> you, you just can't. And if you did, like you, you didn't read it. And if you're reading the Odyssey and thinking, ah, Odysseus is a good guy, I'd like to be like him, you, you, you probably need to spend some more time with Selena right, or others, uh, because you, you don't have a healthy view of the world around you. What do you think, Boris? I would love to hear some of your thoughts. Wonderful job, um, Joel. You reminded me of why uh, Epic remains important in my own life. I wanna ask you uh, two questions, um, and they're driven by uh, Toni Morrison. One of Toni Morrison's uh, largest selling books outside of the bluest eye was The Song of Solomon. And in this book, it, this novel, it's a clear uh, echoing of the Odyssey. There's even a character called Circe, right? So I'm already sold. Um, but what's interesting to me, and this reminds me of your conversation with, uh, with Dennis and, and where I'm reading you, is she was going to write a book about a slave who was actually 
who actually murdered her own children. She had to wrestle with whether she was going to push the narrative into a historical narrative or a mythopoetic narrative. And she chose the mythopoetic because she said that the mythopoetic narrative provides information that history does not. Mm. And I thought her use of the word of information was, was just astounding because it gets away from this real versus unreal and brings up something else. So I kind of, I've heard what you've been saying, but this will allow you to elaborate. What kind of information do you think it provides uh, um, the Odyssey in a way that's productive? Uh, and it may, this may be an opportunity for you to talk about, uh, uh, refer to uh, Michael Smith's book, uh, Michael Weiss's book, Maps of Narrative Therapy, because here, much as, and what I like about Dennis's work is you're not talking about what language is, you're talking about what language does. Mm. And that's what I'm interested in as a rhetorician who's a philosopher, what language does. So you can take that and, and do it at what you will. Okay. Right? How do you respond to this notion of, of, of the mental poetic as information? Yeah. So, okay. And now my second question that I want to answer, and actually this is why I'm so, um, in Amber with your performance. Uh, we both know that in, in, in the academy or in, in the universities, classical literature or the classics are under some kind of pressure, right? And one of the pressure points is, and as you know, there was this moment of, in January 2019 where Daniel Parata, who's a marvelous scholar, who happens to be Asian, H, excuse me, Haitian, he, he said that, that the whiteness of classical literature gets in the way of it doing a certain kind of work. Hmm. And I loved how you actually opened the space for this discussion because you talked about your own whiteness, you talked about your own class. And when you began the story, you didn't offer it as a disembodied kind of narrative you talked about your father, mm. right? And I very much appreciate it because it made it an embodied kind of discussion rather than this kind of academic, oh, well, I'm, I'm distanced from it. So, so that, that you brought that up, what I wanna ask you about is uh, Mary Baird in Woman in Power talks about how in the first book, Telemachus, tells Penelope his mother, when there is a, you know, in book one, when one of the bards is singing about the difficulties of, for the Greek heroes, and Penelope tells him to like, be quiet, or to choose another song. Telemachus tells his own mother, no, 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 no. Uh, go back up to your own room and, and weave, or, and, or do the loom, because this is men's talk. Right? Speech, public speech is for men. So um, Mary Bitt argues that this is the first moment of men telling women in the Western imagination to shut up. <laughs> so, <laughs> and again, I'm glad you opened up this discussion because I was gonna ask you, having no idea that you would just make, you know, that you would make this notion of agency so, so palpable. So I really appreciate that and I thank you for it. So, so I, I want to talk about everything you just said. I want to try to hit a couple of the points uh, to sort of honor your discussion. And I'll do it backwards if I can, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in the Iliad, Hector tells Andromache to go back to her weaving too, right? Um, so I think, it, you know, first point in literature maybe, but uh, Telemachus is experimenting with performing masculinity, but it also starts a theme of marginalizing Penelope because she's a woman, right? And I think that often Penelope is seen as like, this heroine figure, but I actually see her as a tragic figure. She's mm -hmm. like her desire, her personality exists only to glorify Odysseus in his return. So I take a really dim, dim view. She's just so she is this, you know, uh, masculine I, I, ideal. Um, so to dial it back, um, then to talk about um, 
uh, sort of my performance of my positionality. Um, I, you know, I, I know um, Daniel Padilla Peralta, and I think that he's brilliant. Um, and I think he's pointing to something that's essential. Um, as scholars, right, we're taught to say, oh, we're objective. But ob objectivity is nonsense because our engagement with the world is through five senses that we can't test with each other, right? I can't taste a color right? I can't see a smell. Um, and just in the same way, um, you and I might see and hear the same thing, same thing completely differently because of our experiences in the world. And that means our experiences as embodied people in a racialized society. Um, so I think that by owning positionality and explaining it up front, um, I, and by showing my subjectivity, I get closer to being objective or at least creating an objective space where I can talk with people who don't have my experiences and invite them to do the same. Um, and I've learned the value from this from teaching. Um, and so I'll just give you a, a simple example here. I, I realized early in my years of teaching that women, especially women of color, read male characters much better than white men read female characters, right? And I said, well, what is this? And then I read about standpoint theory from feminism, right? Which is the basic idea that if you're lower down on the hierarchy, on the cultural hierarchy, to survive, you have to be able to read the minds and intentions of people above you, right? Um, and so what this means is that, you know, people like me are generally really shitty at empathizing with people who are not like me, right? Whereas other people, right, uh, uh, you know, uh, a woman, it's better at anticipating my needs and desires because our society is structured that way. Um, so that's a really simple thing. Well, I found that um, that people who are marginalized by our society tend to be better readers in my experience of teaching. And so that changed the way I really started to read and teach. And I get in trouble by saying that all the time on hiring committees. And as a professor, um, people are like, well, you're a racist. I'm like, well, aren't we all, right? Um, so that's, I would have been dialed back then to your comment about Toni Morrison. Um, so I had the opportunity this year, there's a group of classicists, um, who, uh, black classicists who run a group called Eos Africana, um, which really focuses on black classicism um, and the experience of sort of rereading the classics um, through black voices, especially American ones and uh, you know, uh, Afro-Caribbean. Um, and we read together Toni Morrison's um, essay, Unspeakable Things Unspoken. Um, and when she talks about myth and mythopoetics, um, is persuasive, but when she performs an interpretation. So in that essay, her interpretation of Moby Dick as an abolitionist narrative is one of the most brilliant persuasive readings that I didn't believe before that I've read in years, right? Um, so when Toni Morrison talks about mythopoetics, for me, she's also echoing Aristotle, who says that myth is better than history because history is particularized, whereas myth is generalized and everybody can see a part of themselves in it. So the power of mytho history is you give someone just enough detail that they follow you, but you leave enough space for them to write themselves into it, right? Mm -hmm. And get more out of it. And then you meet them, author and audience meet in that blended space, right? Where you create something together. And I think that, so that, you know, when in, in Song of Solomon, um, Toni Morrison weaves, to go back to that metaphor, different cultural narratives in a powerful way um, that speaks differently to different audiences. Again, in that same essay, she talks about using uh, Black American vernacular, right? And traditions in a way that you never imagine a powerful novelist to be able to do. Like, I, I, when I read that, I was like, novelists are this good? Right. As a Homerist, like I'm prejudiced towards poets. Right. Um, and then, you know, a great artist um, like Morrison speaks to multiple audiences at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what's going on with the mythopoetics is creating that space where people can meet. You know, well said and well done, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, did I just see it here? Uh, Morrison, Moby Dick, and uh, and uh, the Odyssey in the same breath. I might as well have said, Dennis Slattery, this is, please. Uh, this is a movable feast, thoughts. Joel and uh, Forrest, for bringing those in. I just want to make two comments, and I'm watching the clock, so I, I won't take a minute. What what this what the conversation helped me understand? I think maybe for the first time, or to found maybe I'm finding a language for it. At the end of the Odyssey, 
if <laughs> if one gives um, some privilege to the oath itself, then the hero, Odysseus, has been assassinated. He's not the hero at the end of the Odyssey. The oath is, and the and the and the hero, <laughs> the heroes of the oath are the two communities at war with one another who have found in language, a a, because Athena has said, swear an oath to one another and stop this damn warring. And that's where it ends at the end of book 24. So I'm seeing that Homer <laughs> has assassinated the hero, Odysseus, and installed in his place the, the oath structure in which language itself is heroic. Anyhow, I wanted to share that. And then just a quick observation. Uh, Will brought up Jim Hillman, who has influenced so many of us. And I can't remember if it was something he wrote, uh, Joel, or he said. But his comment was, I'm fine with the Gideon's Bible in the dresser drawers of hotels and motels at least through the United States, but he said next to it ought to be Homer's Odyssey because the people staying in those hotel rooms and motel rooms are either on their way from home or they're heading back to home. And I thought that was brilliant. So I wanted to share that with all of you, but to, to Joel. Yeah. So um, but Dennis, my, my wife's originally from India. And when we go back, we, we tend to stay in hotels instead of with family, just because, you know, there are kids. And in one of the hotel drawers, there was the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Quran, uh, the Book of Mormon, uh, and the Gideon Bible. Um, and next time I go, out, I'll, I'll leave the Odyssey there. Right. Uh, but but the, what you're mentioning, you know, at the end, the oath, the oath is an institution. Right. It is, a, you know, we could go Max Weber with it and say we're moving from charismatic and traditional leadership to bureaucratic leadership. Or we could say something simpler, um, which is that where to go back to what um, Zaman said, um, there's no good or evil in Greek epic at the beginning, but you have to create it by the end. Right. And so the oath is really as part of a institution making in Greek epic, an effort to create things that are better than we are. Right. Create methods for adjudicating our, our crises and creating like a social fabric that's not dependent upon the strength and goodwill of a single person. That's it. So it's a communal shift from the individual heroic to the communal. I'm going to still use the word heroic, but it gets um, relativized from the. Odyssean heroic. So yeah. thank you, Joel. Thank you. Wow, Joel, beautiful evening with us. Thank you. I, the word that comes to my mind that I want to leave us with is service. That when we do the myth salon, when, um, when I do my work with the Tao Te Ching, I'm thinking, who, who are we serving? What is, what is serving? Who is serving whom in a story like the Odyssey? And maybe the antithesis of it is the takeaway that you, you don't see the service. Uh, where's the loyalty? Where is what's going on? And so, each month now we get together, we were doing this, Joel, every two weeks and uh, during the pandemic. And uh, there's a lot of service in this community. There's a lot of people giving of their time, showing up. We make a video after this and we share it and distribute it. And the community builds because everybody gives what they have just what we do. So I really thank you. I, I think you've just been immensely gracious, scholarly. I wish I had professors like you when I was studying, when I was oh so long ago. And um, I would like us just to think about service as I give us a moment of silence as we go forth and let's figure out who and what 
our world is about. There's a reason why we follow the sound into the silence. There's a reason why the Tao Te Ching says, be silent, be still. On that note, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming in today. Beautiful afternoon. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Dennis, Selena. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Care, everyone. Thank you, Joel. Thank Wonderful you. evening. Wonderful. Well done. Take care. Ciao. Bye.